Art is everywhere. Every culture throughout time has their version of it. We build huge, expensive buildings to house what we feel are the best examples of it. But how do we determine if art has value? Philosophers have debated this throughout the ages. There is much written about art and beauty. Is only the beautiful of value? There are market forces that determine art's value to be sure, but that's not the kind of value we're looking for here. How do we as a culture decide what is significant to us, worth saving and revisiting over and over? How do we as a culture decide what art has value? I would suggest that art that carries significant meaning has value. But how do we find the meaning in a work of art, and how do we decide if it is significant? That's what we're here to investigate. There's a concept from psychology known as Gestalt, for which a simplified definition might be the unified whole. When we first come into contact with an artwork, we generally see a holistic overview. As we explore further, we see that the artwork is made up of many parts. These may include color, shape, ideas, symbols, materials, even time. Many elements interact. But how can these inert elements convey meaning? What is it that is other than the sum of these parts? How might we be able to discover this meaning of the artwork? Is this otherness where the meaning lies? Because we are studying art, we need a way to approach artworks in a way that makes some sense for us. How do we analyze an artwork to understand how all the parts work together and decide if they work together well? Dr. Renee Sandell from George Mason University has developed a template to decode art, the FTC palette, which uses the categories form, theme, and context. We're going to explore how using these three concepts might help us understand art more deeply. First, we'll have to figure out what exactly each category means. We need to explore how these three categories interact in a work of art. Then, and here's the fun part, we need to decide if this interaction is interesting and has any relevance to us. The form of the work is how the artwork is. Let's look at some aspects of art that Dr. Sandell has identified as what makes up the form of the work. In the early 20th century, artists and teachers at a German art school known as the Bauhaus identified and standardized for the sake of teaching certain elements that they felt were common to our experience of visual phenomena. These are called the formal elements. These formal elements then have to be put together to interact in some way for our brains to make sense out of the arrangement. In art, we want the arrangement to communicate some meaning. This intentional arrangement is called design or composition. Again, the Bauhaus artists created the principles of design so that they could talk about design concepts. The formal elements and the principles of design have been the foundations for art education in the West ever since. There is some controversy surrounding these foundational concepts, however. Some contemporary art theorists feel that these concepts are outdated and that most contemporary art cannot be understood if we use these concepts when talking about it. These theorists believe that we need new foundational categories. However, if we remember that we are going to include theme and context in our analysis of art, then I think these concepts will give us a common vocabulary to use and some historical reference to the way art educators have taught about art. Now, as controversies go, I know that doesn't stand up to who killed Kennedy or whether Bigfoot actually exists. We'll have to see if these concepts remain useful or not as we look at some art. There are other elements that make up a work of art as well. Like anything physical, art exists in space. It can be flat like a photograph or a painting, or it can be three-dimensional like a sculpture or an installation. However, sometimes there can be a component of time to an artwork. Der Shing Se did a performance piece where he lived in a cage in his studio for an entire year. No TV, no iPods, no newspapers, nothing. A friend brought him food each day. Imagine facing nothing but your own existence for an entire year. What would you think about? What would you learn? How would you change? That's what Se wanted to find out. The media is what the art is made of. There are traditional media, like paint and clay and marble, but many contemporary artists use anything and everything to make art. Some artists are master craftspeople and make exquisite finished products. Other times, artists purposefully make art that looks rough or naive. Sometimes the process is the art and there is no physical product at the end. Often we are impressed by images we can recognize 
and amazed at the skill of artists who can render images of life so well. Leonardo's Mona Lisa is often seen as the epitome of artistic skill. However, sometimes people who have no artistic training make powerful art. The artwork on the right was made by Ken Dwy, who was incarcerated in prison. The only material he had to work with was toilet paper. Using this common material, Dwy was able to create a very expressive artwork. As humans, we like to categorize things. Art can be categorized according to the way it looks or the ideas behind it. You've probably heard the terms cubism or pop art. These categories are usually provided by art critics or historians rather than artists, but they can be a useful guide in helping us understand art. We're going to now look at three artworks. The Death of Socrates by Jacques-Louis David from 1787, Composition with red, yellow, blue, and black, painted in 1921 by Pete Mondrian, and a video work, Through the Night Softly, made by Chris Burden in 1973. Using the categories of form, theme, and context in our analysis, hopefully we'll arrive at a deeper understanding of these artworks, and we'll see how form, theme, and context can be a powerful tool in our search for meaning in art. Recalling the criteria that Dr. Sandel set out for us when it comes to the artwork's form, it is easy to see how David manipulates the aspects of two-dimensional composition to create visual drama in this painting. His use of light and color draws to the main character, Socrates. The rendering of the figures clearly show the emotion of the moment. His skill in using oil paint to create a window on this scene for us is unsurpassed. This is a rather large work, so the scale of it is also impressive. Clearly David is a master at manipulating the formal elements and the principles of design in this painting. Mondrian's painting also manipulates these formal elements and principles of design, but to different ends. Clearly he has no interest in representing reality in a traditional sense. But Mondrian is trying to use the ideas of color, balance, unity, and variety to evoke meaning through the use of abstraction. Let's watch Chris Verdon's video and hear about it in his own words. Ronco presents Good Vibrations, 22 original hits for the Hollies. The TV ad piece came out of a long-standing desire to be on television. The more I thought about it, the simplest way seemed to be to purchase a commercial advertising slot. Acting on that, I pulled out the yellow pages and started calling up TV stations to get their rates. I could only afford to purchase a 10-second spot ID. My biggest problem was convincing the station that I was worth bothering with, that I was uh, legitimate, a legitimate artist. They knew I was a small client, and uh, I knew it too. Uh, what you've been watching is the advertisement that actually precedes mine. That was it. You saw how short it was. But to me, the, the content wasn't so important. It was the idea of being on real TV, which to me means anything you can flip to on a dial. Anything else, cable, educational, video, it's not real TV. I didn't have any illusions that people understood this, that they said, oh, there's Chris Burden and he's doing a performance. But I know it stuck out like a sore thumb and that I had the satisfaction of knowing that 250,000 people saw it every night and that it was disturbing to them that they knew something was amiss. And the ad came on, my ad came on, five times a week for four weeks right after the 11 o'clock news. How the form of this artwork carries meanings is perhaps more elusive. There are some formal and design elements, the light and the movement for example, but they seem like secondary considerations in this work. If we focus on these things, maybe it will actually mislead us in our quest for extracting meaning from this work. Perhaps we need to look elsewhere. The form of the artwork is our initial contact with the work of visual art. But an artist makes art to communicate something. Sometimes an artist will hit us over the head with a message and it's easy to understand the meaning of an artwork. Other times what the work is about is subtle or even intentionally hidden. So how do we know what the work of art is about? Artwork that holds our attention engages us on an emotional and intellectual level and tells us something about the human condition. 
This something we are going to call the artist's big idea. An artist needs a visual vehicle to help with the communication. In his sculpture, Michelangelo uses as his subject the biblical story of David and Goliath. In this story, the Hebrews and the Philistines are at war. In an effort to spare lots of bloodshed, it is arranged that one Hebrew and one Philistine, in this case the strongest warrior Goliath, will fight in a kind of winner-take-all match. None of the Hebrew warriors wanted to fight the formidable giant Goliath. A young boy named David volunteers to fight. David uses his slingshot to defeat Goliath. The subject became the vehicle for Michelangelo to express the big idea of the brave underdog overcoming a stronger force. This big idea of the victory of the underdog represented the victory of Florence over Urbino and the growing independence of Florence from the influence of Rome. David, the subject of the sculpture, becomes the vehicle in which Michelangelo represents the ideals that are important to the people of Florence, which of course interact within the context of the historical events in Italy at the time. Artists don't exist in a vacuum. They are observers of what goes on around them and are influenced by their surroundings. Like anyone, they develop a point of view. In their work, they include, consciously or unconsciously, visual sources of what they see around them. Sometimes they make direct references to other art, the humanities or science. An artist can't help but touch on the knowledge that things that have come before them, because building on experience is part of being alive. Determining these influences help us understand a work of art. So let's take a look at the themes of the three artworks we're following. Here David depicts Socrates, a Greek philosopher, whose ideas got him on the wrong side of the government, and he was given the choice to commit suicide or be banished from Athens. The subject of the painting is the moment when Socrates chose to drink hemlock rather than denounce his values. Obviously David is technically very skilled, but let's see if there is more to the painting than that. Using our criteria, let's see if we can piece together why this is an important and controversial painting. Mondrian's painting doesn't tell a story like the death of Socrates. Is there a theme here? It might take a bit more thinking to find it. See if the responses for each criteria convince you that Mondrian's painting does indeed have a theme. Finding a theme here might even be more difficult. Just like the Mondrian, there's no historical or literary story here, although there is a reference to religious history. Burden's performance doesn't exist in a museum or even use art supplies. Does it even require artistic skill? A very interesting question that perhaps we shouldn't answer too quickly. Remember, Burden wanted there to be no separation between art and life. But someone running a marathon puts their body under extreme conditions, and it is very much real life. We might say that the runner ran an artful race, but we wouldn't say that the act was art. If art should have interaction between form, theme, and context, then we should be able to find viable responses to the criteria on the left if Through the Night Softly is indeed art. Artists are product of their times. To use the common phrase, ahead of their time, really indicates the reluctance of the rest of us to embrace change. Societal and political events become history. Artists both influence and are influenced by these events. Remember that we are trying to see if our understanding of art can be enhanced if we understand the interaction between form, theme, and context. Context is the third piece of the puzzle. What separates relevant and irrelevant events and ideas? 
What makes some themes more worthy of the term big idea than others? Perhaps finding how the context of an artwork plays a part in its creation will help us answer that question. Here again we see the death of Socrates by David. The end of the 18th century was a tumultuous time for France. Spurred on by the ideals of the Enlightenment, equality, citizenship, and unalienable rights, the people of France transformed their society from a monarchy to a republic. Although the political atmosphere surrounding the revolution was complex, the official revolution began in 1789 and the republic was proclaimed in 1792. Things got ugly and even more complicated until Napoleon came to power in 1799, declared himself emperor, which ended the republican phase of the revolution. David was embroiled in the controversy, spent some time in jail, but eventually emerged to become the court painter for Napoleon. This painting was part of the story. We need to think about the time when this painting was made to realize how radical it was. Throughout the 19th century and into the 20th century, factors such as the Industrial Revolution, new scientific discoveries, and political upheavals around the world made people question the legitimacy of old ideas. Artists in particular wanted to create something new and modern to go along with the changing times. Abstraction in art was beginning to develop. A form of art, labeled by critics Cubism, was having a wide influence in Europe. This painting takes the abstract form to an extreme, and it happened only 10 years from when Cubism first emerged on the art scene. Part of the convention of finding new art forms in the 20th century, some artists had begun using their own bodies in their art. Burden takes this idea to an extreme by placing his body under dangerous physical and psychological stress. The U.S. at the time was also in a state of stress. The 60s had been a decade of much social upheaval in the U.S., and this carried over into the 70s. In 1973, the Vietnam War was still underway. Questions and protests put a wedge between an older generation that had experienced what they saw as moral wars against evil forces in Europe and Korea, and a younger generation of Americans who saw the Vietnam War as an imperialist move by the U.S. The Watergate scandal, which led to the resignation of President Richard Nixon, also made people cynical about U.S. governmental institutions. It was an oil crisis in America, where the first time in recent memory, Americans were faced with not controlling their own economic destinies. Burden's work addressed issues of living in these times. So we've explored form, theme, and context as separate entities, but all these attributes interact simultaneously. By analyzing this interaction between form, theme, and context, Perhaps the many layers of meaning in an artwork will be revealed, and we can arrive at a deeper understanding of the artwork. Then possibly our search for meaning will bring us a more profound awareness of why art plays such an important role in understanding what it means to be human. <laughs>